Steve, I gotta admit, I, I've been here several times. I've floated the Grand Canyon, uh, but every time I come here, it is breathtaking. It's huge, isn't it? Uh, give me the big picture, how big is it? Four to 18 miles wide, a mile deep, 275 miles long, something like that. It's visible from outer space. Uh, five million people come and uh, see this thing. It's one of the premier wonders of the world. And geology keeps bringing me back to the canyon. So, Steve, tell me, what, what do you see here? What, what are we looking at? When we look at Grand Canyon, we see or come to grips with the inside story to the ground beneath our feet. There's something here just beyond the, the different colors and the bigness of the canyon that uh, commands our attention, isn't it? And we see sedimentation, the process of the formation of the rock layers of the earth here. And we see erosion, and we see uh, the power of water and erosion. Uh, we see the evidence of volcanoes and uplift and upwarp, all kinds of geologic process. It's uh, pretty much like the rest of the world, but it's so well displayed here that it, uh, it confronts us. Directly. So it's kind of like the, the picture is that we have these layers all over the world, but we've, we've got this uh, blessing that it's been cut out for us, and now we're looking at all of those layers, right? Yes. So, so kind of walk us through the history that you see here of all that we see in front of us. Uh, we see this layer cake of strata, and we go down to the bottom of the cake to see the earliest events associated with the formation of the strata and eventually the whole Grand Canyon. Down by the river, around the corner here, we have granite and we have uh, a rock called schist and gneiss. These rocks form the core of the continent down deep, somehow related to creation week, I believe. Above those uh, non-stratified rocks, we have a diagonally tilted package of sandstone and shale and limestone here visible from the rim that are likely creation week rock or even pre-flood but post-creation week rock. In other words, ocean floor at some time in the history of the earth. Then on top of that, we have flat-lying strata on a beveled surface. And this beveled surface is rather obvious in back of us, but the flat-lying 4,000 feet of strata sits on this erosion surface. And that's called the Great Unconformity. And then on top of the Great Unconformity is that 4,000 feet of flat-lying strata up to the rim. And that, that brings us up to here? That brings us right here to the Kaibab limestone on the rim. That 4,000 feet of strata is sandstone, a shale, and limestone. And it forms this broad blanket sequence that we see across, the, uh, across North America and even uh, to the world. I think that 4,000 foot interval and that scour surface underneath it, the Great Unconformity, represents the onset of the flood and the flood deposition. We have other strata in the Grand Canyon region. That's called the Grand Staircase. We have about 10,000 feet, two miles thickness of strata on top of the Grand Canyon. Higher than where we are. Higher than where we are. And that represents the, the later stages of the flood and the retreat of the flood water. This surface was beveled by a retreat of flood waters and of course uh, later acquired lake basins and, and then uh, the Colorado River was established after the breaching of these big dams and failure of these lakes. You're talking about three miles of sediment here then. Three miles of sediment. So the, the flat-lying strata show the history from uh, the beginning of the flood through into the post-flood period that we live in right now. Well, the layers themselves, as we can see, have that straight line with them. And I can understand that if they were exposed to the elements, for millions of years that we may not even see the layer, right? Or at least we would see erosion evidence to and, it. And we'd have canyons within canyons and buried canyons in the uh, strata, and that's, uh, that, that's foreign to what we see in the, in the big picture of strata across the North American So continent. we'd see something much more complex, is what you're saying here, rather than these uh, very nice, neat layers. Yeah, and we have a layer cake here uh, and it, it, it needs a very simple explanation, not a, not a complicated uh, uh, millions of years explanation. 
You know, time is not the magic wand to Grand Canyon. It doesn't solve all the problems. It actually creates problems. And so we need to think in this new domain outside the box, if you will, uh, in, the, in the creation flood, post-flood model. That explains or helps direct our thinking pattern to, uh, and challenge us to do our best work. Steve, take us back to those people who began that uh, story, that paradigm. Uh, there's a famous medical doctor named James Hutton who introduced concepts that later became part of this big paradigm. But he influenced another geologist named Charles Lyell. And Charles Lyell, about 1830, wrote a book called Principles of Geology, where he illustrated the views of Hutton in a very direct way. And it was Lyell who was the teacher of Charles Darwin. Hmm. And Adam Sedgwick, a catastrophist geologist, and Charles Lyell, a uniformitarian geologist, those were the two primary teachers of Charles Darwin. Hmm. And Charles Darwin received his education, believe it or not, in geology. He was trained by geologists. And then he went on to write some papers for about 10 years till he got sick uh, with uh, some type of general uh, illness. He, he participated in field trips and did a lot of geology. He wrote geologic papers. And so Charles Darwin was trained by geologists. He performed as a geologist. He thought like a geologist. And for his early career, he was a geologist, obviously. He had rock hammer. He did geologic maps. He drew stratigraphic cross sections. Darwin is a geologist, just like me. So I can challenge that paradigm system of Darwin. But Darwin went on to influence uh, the, the, the worldview in a very different way. He went into biology and started applying and thinking about natural selection and uh, evolution of species. And uh, when that happened, that whole paradigm shifted. And of course, today, we're going back and we're remembering, I, I'm remembering that Charles Darwin was a geologist and he needs, we need to go back and challenge the foundation of his way of thinking. Was it data and evidence then that, that drove them deeper and deeper into millions and billions of years? Uh, not really. It was their paradigm or their belief system that allowed them to process data in a certain way to support the paradigm or, or to illustrate what they believed about their paradigm. So when someone uh, begins to hold that paradigm, uh, what kind of influence does that have then when they come to the Grand Canyon and see the evidence? Does it play in what they see? Well, most people come to the Grand Canyon and what? They know the story they're told mm -hmm. and they say, wow, what a, what a marvelous canyon the Colorado River eroded over tens of millions of years. Okay, and it's hard not to have a paradigm dependent understanding of Grand Canyon, but we need to go back to data and yes. ultimately we need to consider what it is that is illustrating our understanding of history here. I'll tell you what, I've been rafting on that river and there's something in me that wants to get back down there. Is there a way we can go back down and see some things closer? Well, I'd love to take you down uh, in the Wallapai Reservation where uh, some of my friends, the Indians, uh, like to take me, uh, show me rock layers. And uh, so uh, can I take you down Absolutely. there? Absolutely, I'm, I'm on your tail. Okay. Well, Steve, thanks for letting us stop at the river on the way to the Nautiloids. It's a beautiful place. This is where the conventional story tells us it's this river that carved all of this out. It is. And as we look at rivers, there's a power in thinking about a modern river and what it might do, such as I wrote a big canyon. Uh -huh. Let me show you two things right away, and uh, let's de delve into some, some thinking about the canyon. Uh, we have a 10,000 cubic feet per second flow down the Colorado River here. Present. Presently. Mm -hmm. And we have this granite gorge sitting here. Do you think that granite gorge was cut by the action of a, of a flow like this today? That's what the story says. That's what the story says. There are historic photographs 
about 150 years old, showing rapids here in the Colorado River. And we can come back and look at the rapids now. The boulders in the rapids haven't changed position. It's interesting that the rapids haven't changed over 150 years. And there have been some pretty big floods between then and now, haven't there? Yes, uh, there have been floods over 25 times the present flow of the river. A quarter million cubic feet per second have been going down the, the channel of the Colorado River. That's a really big flood. It is. Okay, but it still didn't move the boulders. Uh -huh. Okay, and the channel is lined, the side of the channel of the river is lined by slope boulders that have fallen into the bank of the river, and the bank of the river is stable, not just the rapids. And the bottom of the river is stable. It's full of uh, gravel and sand. So the, the Colorado River is in deepening or widening the canyon. So the ultimate question is, what cut what cut the granite gorge? Right. If it wasn't if it wasn't the river, then how in the world do we get all this material out of here? We need a huge amount of water. We need super big flood flows, hundreds of times, thousand times the present flow. Uh, we got to have a big lake or some type of container that uh, fails to to give deliver that kind of water to this gorge. I think there's a lake over there in the Painted Desert, about 500 cubic miles of water at about 6,000 feet elevation, that the fall of that water down through a spillway could easily erode a canyon like this. So that much water can really take all this material out in a short period of time? Uh, it can, and uh, let me tell you about the, the four different processes of, of erosion, slow and catastrophic erosion. We have solution. The river is actually dissolving away in weak, very weak way, the, uh, the rock. Uh, abrasion, that's where particle impacts particle going down the, the river. The third agent of erosion is a catastrophic agent. It's called plucking. When fluid flow in, a, in the riverbed gets so big, it's able to flush all the rocks in the channel, that energy can be expended on prying the cracks of the rock in the channel apart. It's called hydraulic plucking. Mm. And the ultimate example is an underwater tornado, essentially. A catastrophic flow can generate that. So just like a regular tornado that can pull things up off of the ground, yes. it does it here underwater. It can do it underwater. Mm. And then the fourth uh, agent of erosion is very catastrophic. When water flows very rapidly, like about 20 feet per second down a channel, uh, that uh, a velocity allows vacuum bubbles to form, especially in uh, downstream of an obstacle. The water flow going over that obstacle creates low pressure. When that pressure gets low enough, it gets to what's called the vapor pressure of water. Then water is torn open and a, and a cavity is formed in that water. That's a vacuum bubble. Mm -hmm. and that vacuum bubble can collapse or implode and it's next to a rock and when it implodes, it's like dynamite. A catastrophic erosion by uh, cavitation, this process of collapse of bubbles, is uh, well understood by engineers, especially in spillways and tunnels. Do we have evidence of that uh, recently that we've seen that cavitation at work? One uh, possibility is Mount St. Helens. We have a 600 foot deep canyon eroded in solid rock since 1980. There's a lot of that through cavitation. And maybe cavitation and plucking by mud flows mm -hmm. and high velocity flows there. Rapid erosion can create deep bedrock canyons. That's, uh, that's what we see at Mount St. Helens. We have some modern examples like a Glen Canyon Dam. Which is just upstream. Just upstream here of uh, catastrophic erosion by cavitation. In uh, 1983, flood flows in the upper part of the Colorado River drainage basin filled Lake Powell completely, and they needed to open the spillway tunnels to allow rapid drainage of uh, water over the top of the lake. To save the dam. To save the dam. And uh, the 40-foot diameter right spillway tunnel was uh, opened, and water went down this inclined 40-foot diameter tunnel, and it burrowed out through the concrete and the steel 62,500 cubic feet of concrete was needed to fill this cavity that formed. How long did it take for that to? Uh, they, they think it took minutes for cavitation to erode that bedrock. So just like, like butter. 
like yeah. a night, so night they're not ex better. explosion induced catastrophic erosion. Mm -hmm. We even felt earthquakes during the time and they, the, the water spilling out of the tunnel was seen to be red. So it was obvious that something catastrophic had happened there at Glen Canyon Dam. Water has incredible power. It can not only rapidly cut the inner gorge here in the granite along the Colorado River, but it could also bevel the surface like we see in the lower part of the Grand Canyon, the granite. And the, the granite basement rock during the initial stage of the flood could be beveled rapidly. So we need to think about incredible power of water. And right here, thinking about the Colorado River, thinking about the Inner Gorge, commands our attention to what? Think about that uh, beveled surface with the sandstone sitting on top of it. And there is also catastrophic erosion, not, on a, not in a channel, but on a continent, and or even the intercontinental scale. Well, Stephen, we, we think about the evidence that we've seen in terms of the power of water. Mount St. Helens, uh, Glen Canyon Dam, uh, the other places we've seen that uh, have shown us that water is extremely powerful. Geologists are now beginning to recognize that it's the conventional story about the river carving this out is not right. Is that true? That's right. And there's kind of a consensus among geologists today that Colorado River did not evolve slowly over tens of millions of years. Most geologists suggest that the canyon appears abruptly in some way. And that's why I, as a catastrophist, think I have a contribution to make, because I can understand how a, a canyon can form catastrophically. Well, why do people still teach that? Why is it still on the signs? Uh, it's a myth, isn't it? It's a nature myth about what we, uh, what we think about origins. And it's, it's just easy to think about, and uh, it's customary, and it's in our experience. But we need to think outside of our experience, and we need to think creatively and sometimes outside the box really to solve the problems like what cut the uh, granite here in the inner gorge. Thinking outside the box though, what you're saying is to actually look at the evidence, look at the truth of what we see. Yeah, and not, not be uh, persuaded by the conventional or uh, the way things appear or just looking at the present. We need to think creatively about the number of different ways that things can form. Thank you.